The Ultimate Universe is back, but it's a bit different. 20 years ago, the Maker prevented a radioactive spider from biting a young Peter Parker. He likewise prevented the creation of any other superheroes and formed a secret council that would rule the world from the shadows. When Tony Stark learned the dark history of the universe, he sought to undo it, prompting the Maker's Council to attack Manhattan, killing thousands, framing Stark for it. Peter Parker has lived his life unaware of the Maker's Council or the truth behind the spider. But that is about to change. This is Comic Storian, where I take some of your favorite comic books and I turn them into audio dramas. The purpose of this is so that you know what's going on in the world of comics, such as incredible storylines like the brand new Ultimate Spider-Man. If you enjoy this type of content, consider supporting the channel for even more content at Patreon or YouTube memberships. January in New York. Snow falls from the skies and it blankets the city in white. In his apartment, Peter Parker is struggling out of bed, looking at himself in the mirror. Peter Parker, you're not getting any younger. He sighs quietly quickly getting dressed and pulling on his wedding ring before heading into the kitchen, greeting his two kids. You sound tired, late night? His son Richard asks. He kisses them both on the head and reaches for a pot of coffee that awaits him. Thank God for mom, he whispers. Thank God for coffee, and I gotta say, Tiger, you look like you need it. Mary Jane says as she walks into the room. The two kiss, and she asks if he's been having trouble sleeping. Peter nods, taking some big gulps of the liquid. He turns back to his briefcase to see May reaching inside, pulling out a shiny silver ball. Nuh-uh, not a toy, kiddo, Peter says as he takes it away from her. He promises MJ that they'll talk about what's been bothering him later, and he heads out the door to head to work. A short time later, Peter walks through the bullpen of the Daily Bugle. Everyone turns as J. Jonah Jameson comes barging out of his office. Parker! Parker! He bellows, but he stops as he passes Peter. Oh! Hey there, Peter. No time for chit-chat, he says with a smile before passing him. Parker! He continues to yell, finally stopping in the office of the managing editor of the paper, Ben Parker. My ears work fine, Jonah. There's no need to yell, Ben says from behind his desk. Jameson smiles at his friend and asks if he needs the four o'clock meeting pushed back for his thing. Ben shakes his head, telling him that he should be there without an issue. Peter sticks his head through the door. Here's your guy. Jonah says. Hey, Ben. You ready to go? Peter asks, and Ben nods, pulling on his jacket. And the two of them head for the door, with Jonah stopping Peter. Parker, hold on a second. Where's your tie? Jonah asks. Peter looks down in shock and mumbles about not even owning a tie. And Jonah waves him off, pulling off his own tie from around his neck, tying it for the young man. Peter glances over Jonah's shoulder to see his retreating uncle. How do you think he's doing, Jonah? Peter whispers, and Jonah raises an eyebrow at him. Have I ever told you about how much we love to sit around and talk about our feelings? Your uncle and I? Jonah jokes, finishing tying the tie. If you really want to know how your uncle is doing, you could always just ask. Jonah says as he waves Peter out the door. The two walk through the snowy streets of the city, heading towards the memorial. Peter finally works up the nerve to ask his uncle how he's feeling, pointing out how Ben has only said one word about how he's feeling or doing. Ben glances at him as they are walking, and finally, he speaks. Peter, you were 15 when your parents had died and you came to live with May and I. We loved you unconditionally. We protected you. I tried to teach you about the world and prepare you for it, but one thing we never tried to do was replace your parents. Because we couldn't. Ben says, pointing out that Peter's parents died 20 years ago. It's been a long time. But has one day gone by that you haven't thought about them? Is there one day that doesn't hurt that they're gone? Peter looks at the ground. No, he whispers. Ben nods and they continue walking towards the memorial. Then I think you know exactly how I feel. They finally arrive at the memorial for the Stark attack. May Parker's name is written amongst all the others who lost their lives that day. A blind priest presides over the memorial, speaking about how it is sad that so many lives were lost that day. But those that were taken would want the rest to continue, to remember the good times that they had. Father Murdoch finally steps away, allowing Harry Osborn to speak, who lost both his mother and his father that day. Harry stands before the crowd, agreeing with Father Murdoch, but points out that memories alone aren't enough. That it is wrong that those lives were taken from them. Our future was stolen and exchanged with memories. It's just not enough. And I'm not sure any of us should be expected to live with it, 
Harry says in closing. Afterwards, Peter stands with his family for a few moments longer, promising MJ that he'll head home right after checking in at the office. Ben and Peter return to the Daily Bugle just in time to see Jonas standing before a board of directors meeting. He throws a handful of newspapers at them and storms out the door. I quit! He shouts, walking past Ben and Peter, staring at them both. But before he leaves, Ben glances at Peter. Go to your desk, Peter. Keep your head down. We'll catch up later. Ben says before walking into the meeting room and standing before the board. So, did I miss anything? He asks quietly. Robbie Robinson looks up from his spot and explains that Jonah was made aware of some editorial restructuring at the paper and wasn't a fan of those changes. But the board is aware of the complaints from advertisers about some of the paper's inflammatory content and they were uncomfortable with how much the paper has been looking into the Stark terror attack. So we're going to be making some changes on behest of both the board and the broader ownership in general, Robbie tells him. Ben looks at the newest member sitting at the far end of the table, flanked by an eye patch wearing bodyguard. Jameson's out. Now the paper needs new leadership. You are the obvious choice. It seems you've gotten yourself a promotion, Wilson Fisk says, revealing himself. That's if you want the job, of course. If you can... Toe the line, he says with a smile. Ben smiles back for a moment before turning and walking out the door. He meets Jonah in the elevator as the old newsman just finished packing his desk. The doors behind them close as they leave the Daily Bugle behind. So what are we going to do now? Ben asks his old friend. Later, Fisk and his bodyguard are heading towards their waiting car downstairs, and just as Fisk is getting into it, something flies out of the air, blowing up the car. The guard pulls Fisk to safety, looking up in shock to see an armored green goblin fly away on a glider. Close by at the bar with no name, Ben and Jonas sit at the table enjoying a few rounds of beer, deciding that they need to start their own paper. Get back to the roots that they love. We'll do it right. We'll tell the truth, Ben says, and Jonah just laughs and I'm pointing out that there is no truth in news and no news in truth. How about this? We just promise not to lie. Jonah finally relents, and the pair are joined by Peter, who informs them that Robbie has been put in charge of the paper as of now. His job is still secure. Jonah finishes his beer and leaves the Parkers alone. Peter looks up at Ben and asks him a simple question. Ben, I gotta know, how'd you do it? Peter asks, wanting to know how Ben could so easily leave his job behind. Ben shrugs and explains that he doesn't have a wife and a family to care for anymore, so the choice was easy. Peter nods, looking at the table. What's going on, Peter? Ben asks, and Peter looks up at his uncle, finally admitting what's bothering him, explaining that he feels like something is wrong with his life. Like something is missing. Like he's supposed to be something more, and he doesn't know what to do. Ben finally smiles at him and begins to stand, informing his nephew that he can't wait for something to happen, that he needs to take action. I love you, son, but if you're walking around half asleep with your own life, it's time to wake up, he says, patting Pete on the shoulder and heading out of the bar. Later that night, Peter returns home, putting his kids to bed. He comes out to the living room and finds MJ waiting with a bottle of wine. They talk briefly about their day before MJ finally asks Peter what's been bothering him. Peter finally tells her that he needs a change. MJ supports him, pointing out that when she quit her job last year to start her own business, Peter supported her without question. But Peter shakes his head and looks right at her. No, MJ, I think I need to change, he says, and she nods, explaining that she's seen him walk around for years with a cloud over his head. You put on a good face, but you're not satisfied with who you are, she says, putting a hand on his knee. Do you know what you have to do? I think so. Yeah, he says quietly, and she frowns at him. Are things going to change between us? She asks. Never, he says immediately and confidently. She nods, standing, kissing him on the forehead. Well then, that settles it. I'm going to bed and you go get him, tiger, she says before walking out of the room. Peter waits for a moment before standing. He reaches into his briefcase, pulling out the silver ball, and he walks to the roof of their building. At the top, the snow is falling on him as he looks at the ball, remembering last night. He was working late in the living room when the energy began to spark on the counter and the strange box appeared. As Peter reached out for it, more energy appeared and an image of Tony Stark was suddenly standing there. Hello, 
If this has gone as I hoped, I should be speaking to Peter Parker, Tony says. I'm sending you this six months in the future. There was an attempt on my and my companions' lives, and we've only had seconds to escape before the orbital platform fired. Tony continues, shocking Peter with this knowledge of the terror attack. Tony continues, explaining that 20 years ago, a man known as the Maker came to their world and began to alter time. To make it so that heroes would never be born. That Peter was supposed to be bitten by a radioactive spider and he was going to gain superpowers. He then set up his own secret cabal and began to quietly control the world. I'm repeating this with others like you. And in six months, if I've done this correctly, I will exit this room and find an Earth that has regained its heroes. Tony says. He tells Peter that he was supposed to have a different life. You were supposed to protect the innocent, save lives, inspire citizens of this world to be their best selves. Instead, all of that was taken from you. These people stole your future. These people robbed you of your destiny. The question is, do you want to take it back? Tony finishes. Now back on the rooftop, the windy snow blowing around him, Peter taps the silver ball and it begins to transform in his hand. It reveals a small vial with a radioactive spider inside. I want it, Peter whispers, releasing the spider and allowing it to land gently on his hand. As the sun begins to rise over the buildings, Peter stands ready with a new costume from the silver ball. A new hero. And that concludes the brand new Ultimate Spider-Man. If you enjoyed it, like and subscribe, because this story is to be continued.